hear me? Ranko, if you can hear me now? Yeah, now, yes. Yes, good, good. Uh, we want to welcome you again virtually here to Brisbane, Australia, Ranko. It seems to me that I am flying very, very fast. Last night I was in Australia, uh, according to Michigan time, and then this morning I was in Europe with another church. So now I'm back to Australia. Can you believe that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for the sake of you who are joining and you have never seen Dr. Ranko Stepanovic, he's, uh, uh, he's a friend, he's a pastor, he's also a lecturer, uh, at Andrews University of New Testament Studies with actually with specialty on the book of Revelation. And he has written a book which is a textbook for our theology students. And he has a, a longer version of it as well as a shorter version of that book. He has also written uh, a, a commentary on the, book of, uh, on the book of Romans, which is actually coming up, I believe not in the long future. Uh, so and he's been very busy. He's a sought-after speaker, and um, and I know that he has been very, very busy. But today we, we want to welcome you to, to Mangrava Church, as well as uh, for the benefit of people who are joining Mangrava Church to the sides today. So God bless, and I'm looking forward to your message, Ranko. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Zeni. Uh, I don't know. There is one detail that you did not mention, talking that we are friends. By the way, it is probably about less than 200 kilometers, the distance between the two places where I was born and when you were born. Of course, you were born much, much later than me, but we are coming from the same part of the world. Am I correct? That's correct. Yes. It is my great privilege to spend this time with all of you there in Brisbane. And as I know that there are some people who are watching who are outside of Brisbane and maybe even outside of Australia who are joining us here for this special occasion. And then Pastor Zeni asked me to have a special message to share with you. I was thinking a lot which one, and I decided actually to share with you uh, something that God used to change my personal life and my um, look toward the world in which I live and toward the circumstances and in which I live. And this comes from probably the best known aspect of Jesus' teaching that is usually known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is not only valued by Christians, it's also a well-known aspect of Jesus' teaching among non-Christians. So, for instance, Mahatma Gandhi, he valued the Sermon on the Mount greatly. And he said, I don't have a problem with Jesus Christ. The problem I have with those who call themselves to be the followers of Jesus Christ. But they don't follow the teachings of Jesus. And I know that most of us who are participating here to this conversation and study of the biblical text, you're very much familiar with this sermon. And, me, and we know that this sermon that we call the Sermon on the Mount is recorded in the three chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, that chapters five to seven. But not too many Christians actually realize that there is another version 
of this sermon. And it is recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. By the way, to be more accurate, it's in Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 20 to 29. As you can notice, we mentioned already that the sermon in, the Mat in Matthew is recorded in three chapters, chapters 5, 6, and 7. But the sermon in Luke is found only in 29 verses, verses 20 to 49. And liberal scholars, they simply say, do you see, Jesus never, never spoke that sermon. Actually, what we have in the Gospels is that Matthew made a collection, some of Jesus' sayings from his teachings, organized together and put it in the form of a sermon and included it into his Gospel. But Luke, on the other side, he collected some of the teachings of Jesus much less, and he included it into his gospel. Actually, I disagree with that. As a scholar, I like to challenge scholarship. And let me tell you what I believe about these two sermons. I believe that these were the real sermons that Jesus preached. And they are not identical, they are different. I believe that we can assume that Jesus as a great teacher and preacher, he preached regularly. We don't know how many times during the, the, the week. However, as any preacher, so Jesus as well, he did not every time preach a new sermon or a new topic to another audience. I believe that Jesus, like many preachers, actually would take one topic, one theme, and he would preach it in different places, at different occasions. So Matthew recorded a long sermon that Jesus preached at one occasion there at the Sea of Galilee. But Luke included a very similar sermon that Jesus preached on the other occasion, which was much shorter sermon. And he included it into his gospel. Now there is a question, why Luke included one sermon and why uh, Matthew included another sermon? First, we have to realize that the four Gospels were written to different kind of people. And the Gospel writers, as they were describing and recording and presenting the life of Jesus, they always had a certain audience in mind. It is well known that Matthew wrote his Gospel to the Christians who were coming of the Jewish background. Many of those Christians, or some of those Christians, were former Pharisees, very much legalists. They believed that they were in good relationship with God. And they did not have a, too much problem with the physical needs. The problems were spiritual. And Matthew, in the writing, his gospel on the life of Jesus. He decided to include this sermon into his gospel. But look, he wrote his gospel to Gentiles. When he wrote his gospel and described the life of Jesus, he had a particular group of people in mind. And that group included, of course, Gentiles, but included poor people, included those who were outcasts from the society. 
the women who did not have any right in the society of that time. So when you read the Gospel of Luke, you will notice that these kind of people are always focused in, of, his, of his gospel. That's why in the gospel, only in the gospel of Luke, we have the parable of the uh, rich man and Lazarus, the parable of the good Samaritan. Only in Luke, we have the conversion of the tax collector, Zacchaeus. Only he mentions Mary Magdalene in certain context. Why in the other three gospels, Jesus was crucified on the cross among two criminals who died as criminals according to Matthew, Mark, and the Gospel of John. Only Luke is telling us that one of those two criminals actually repented just before his death and got from the Jesus a promise that he will see Jesus in the paradise. So this is very important that we keep it in mind. So now, if you, if you are having your Bibles, I would like to invite you that you join me and you open your Bibles and that you open the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 to 7, okay? Can you open it? I will wait for a few moments as you are searching it. You who have found already uh, that uh, uh, sermon, in Matthew ch chapter five to seven, I will now ask you that you do something. You see, you found that sermon. Now if you can turn also to the gospel of Luke chapter six, we want just to see something between these two, uh, uh, these two accounts, okay? So Matthew chapters five to seven, and also Luke chapter six. There is one thing you can notice that you see that I was right, what I, what, what I was talking to you. If you go to the beginning of chapter five, then it states clearly that Jesus spoke this sermon from the mount. Keep that in mind, from the mount. But please now, can you now turn to the gospel of Luke, chapter six, and we will read in verse 16, that the sermon that Luke recorded was not spoken on the mount. It was spoken as Jesus came out from the mount in the valley. You can see that. These are two different sermons on two different occasions and two different groups of audience. But I'd like now just, just that we take and see a few details. I want that you see the basic difference between these two sermons. And now we will understand why Matthew chose one and Luke chose another one. Okay, are you ready for this? You know that Sermon on the Mount begins with the introduction that is called the Beatitude, both in Matthew and Luke. This is a common, okay? This is the common part that they share. But let us see some of those Beatitudes how they are mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. So Matthew chapter five, we read verse three. Are you ready for this? Blessed are the poor, which poor? The poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So this is really those who are poor in the spirit, they are addressed. Can you now turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter six? Let us see the same attitude there. It's in verse 20. Blessed are you who are poor. Those people are not poor in the spirit. They're poor, they don't have the money to pay their bill, to pay for their electricity, to provide for their food. They're very poor. You see the difference? Let's go back to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Let's go back to see verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Let's go and see the same attitude, how Jesus preached to different kind of audience in, the, in Luke chapter six. And we read in verse 21, blessed are you 
who hunger now for you shall be satisfied. And I have to stop here. I believe once our study is over, when you come home, you will now be interested to compare these two accounts and you will see some basic difference. But just these few moments that we have taken show to us that the reason why Matthew included this sermon, because he was speaking to the people whose major problem were spiritual needs. Okay? But in Luke, he chose Jesus' teaching and Jesus' statements, okay, that, are, that deal exclusively with the physical needs. Why are we mentioning this? Praise God that we have four Gospels. Because some of us, we could read Matthew chapter 5 to 7 and say, I'm sorry. My problem and my need, my needs are not a spiritual, but nobody knows how much I'm suffering physically. I have health problems. I have problem with poverty. I have problem with relationships with the people. My friends, they betrayed me. They put me aside. They don't want to have anything with me. That's why we have that another sermon that is described in the Gospel of Luke. Okay? So, as, even though we will now focus on the account that is found in the Gospel of Luke, but what we will be talking, that our topic that comes out of Jesus' teaching is a topic that is related to both the spiritual and the physical need. And I believe that each one of us, we can find the answer to our problems and find out how Jesus Christ, our Savior, can satisfy our needs, whether physical or spiritual. There is something that is very common to these sermons, both in Matthew and Luke. And you will notice that both the sermons, they begin with the same introduction, with the same introduction. And that introduction actually consists of eight or nine statements or sentence. Each one begins with one and the same word. And in our English translations, it's the word blessed. You notice it. Blessed are those who are poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are gentle, etc., etc. Maybe some of you who are uh, are participating with us in this study, you have different versions of the Bible, maybe some modern versions of the Bible, and you, you do not have the word uh, blessed. You have the word happy. And some more, not literal translation of the Bible, they don't have the word happy or blessed. They have the word fortunate. So why is this such a difference, difference in translation. I have to remind you that the New Testament was not written in English language, even though some of us, we wish it was. We know that it was written in Greek. So we are dealing here with Bible translations. And I guess that great number of us watching this program are bilingual speaking two languages or maybe three languages. And you are aware so many times when you are trying to translate something from one language to another one, you simply say, there are no equivalent expressions. This is impossible to translate in my language or from my language into another language. This is exactly the case that we have here. And the word that is found here, that is translated with blessed, happy, or fortunate. In Greek, it's the word makarios. I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint, but 
some of you are maybe taking notes. And if you want, and the spelling is M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S, Makarios. This is the word that Jesus used. Let me explain about the meaning of this word at the time of Jesus when Jesus spoke of this sermon. The word Makarios was very significant in the Gentile world or the Greek world of the time. Among the Greeks, the word Makarios was used with reference to, to a person or to persons who were spared of any hardship of life. It was used with reference to people who experienced everything good in this life. Just imagine that there was a person, he had a good family, he enjoyed good health, was very much situated, had a lot of money to satisfy all his needs, had a great relationship with people. Ancient Greeks would say, he is Makarios. Since ancient Greeks, they believed that that well-being of the person came from gods. Makarios had the meaning of being blessed by gods. That's why the word blessed, it's very accurate. But when the person is blessed, when everything goes well in this life, the person is happy or fortunate. That's why the word happy also rightly to, is translation of this word. Now you understand that we don't have English equivalent to express the meaning that the word makarios denoted in, 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 the, in the Greek language. So whether blessed or happy, it's not either or. It's blessed and happy. The two words are really complementary. So try, try to think at this moment. Among ancient Greeks, why was the person Makarios? Why was the person blessed? Why do we say, call certain people to be happy in this life? Why? Because that person did not go through any hardships or difficulties of this life. So among ancient Greeks, human happiness and the well-being was defined by external circumstances. You see, when everything goes well for a person, good relationship within family with the friends, when the person makes a lot of money and his health or her health is not ruined, then that person is blessed and happy. However, this is the Greek in the human concept of happiness. How long does this happiness last? As long as the fair, favorable circumstances. However, when the circumstances change and go into opposite direction, that blessedness melts and that happiness disappears. So it means that among ancient Greeks, the human happiness depends on the circumstances and the chances of this life. Now Jesus is using this word, and he refer, uh, reversed completely the meaning of the word that it had among ancient Greeks. So among Jesus, who are blessed? Did you notice it? Those who are poor, those who mourn, those who are hungry and thirsty, 
those who are rejected by people, those who are persecuted. They are blessed and happy. They are Makarios. Are you puzzled over, over this? My question to you at this moment is, was really Jesus realistic? Or at least, as we read and interpret Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that maybe the problem is with us that we do not make actually Jesus' statements realistic for this, for this life. So many times I hear how people are reading this sermon and also some other teachings of the Bible, and they say, do you see how rich people are cursed? But blessed people, uh, but poor people are blessed. At the same time, those Christians are giving tithe, bringing up to the church, and they read the book of Malachi, hoping if they're faithful to God, giving tithe to the church, that God will bless them and they will have more. They don't believe that they will be blessed by God and become poor as a result of that. I never seen any Christians, I'm sorry, during this time of coronavirus, I didn't hear anybody to say, you see, that Christian, he died because of coronavirus. Oh, how blessed he is. No. I hear people say, you see, he survived the coronavirus situation. Do you see how he is blessed, fortunate, and happy? because of that happened. Sometimes when we read the Bible and read these teachings of Jesus, I find the Christians so many times are not realistic. And sometimes we completely misread the teaching of Jesus. So please now allow me because the time is flying very fast. I want really to make a, my own translation of these Beatitudes. Just mention two or three, the rest you can do for yourself. In the way how Jesus actually spoke and how Jesus wanted these Beatitudes to be understood. Jesus never, never meant, as many people understand that Jesus said, you are blessed because you are poor. Because in the Bible, the abundance is the blessing from God. Jesus never intended to say, you're blessed because you are hungry and thirsty. You are blessed because you mourn because of your difficulties that you go and that you have in your lives. Jesus never, never intended that his sayings be understood in that way. When we read the Greek text carefully, the reading is like this. Blessed are those who are poor despite the fact that they are poor. Let me read one more time to make clear. Blessed are you, what Jesus said, in spite, despite the fact that you are poor because your is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who belong to me, despite the fact that they are hungry and thirsty, that they are going through the difficulties of life. Because one day, their needs will be, will be satisfied. This is actually what Jesus tried to say to his disciples. Jesus never, never tried to tell us that the real blessing is because people suffer. What Jesus tried to say to his disciples and also to us today who are his disciples, that we are blessed in spite of all the difficulties, of the hardships of life, and what we are experiencing in this life. One biblical scholar actually 
interpreted the words of Jesus in the following way. Please, let me just read it to you. He said that I communicate. He expressed it so nicely. He said, Macarius, in the words of Jesus, describes the joy which has its secret within itself. The joy which is completely independent of all the chances and the changes of life. Human happiness is something which is dependent on the chances and the changes of life, something which life may give and which life may also destroy. The Christian blessedness is completely untouchable and unsaceable. No one, said Jesus, will anybody be able to take your joy from you. The Beatitudes speak of that joy which seeks us through pain, that joy which sorrow and loss and pain and grief are powerless to touch that joy which shines through tears and which nothing in life or death can take away. This is actually what Jesus tried to communicate to his disciples and the people who were listening to him 2,000 years ago. And this is the message that still speaks to us even during this time as the whole humanity globally has found itself in this great, great crisis in which many people have lost their lives and many people have found themselves in a very, very difficult situation. The rest of the people are affected in different ways economically, and most people, they live in a terrible fear. Now there is a question, when we are talking about that situation in which the humanity has found itself today, what is the difference between those who are on God's side and they put the trust in God and those who are not on God's side? What is the difference? And does it make any, any difference? We saw already, and during our interview, we already explained that God never promised to his faithful people that because we believe in him, we serve him, when the difficulties come, he would take us out of the difficulties and of the hardships of life. God never promised to us. Yesterday, we studied Psalm 23, which telling us that God's people many times will have, and they do walk through the even valley of the shadow of death. And God never promised, as we read in Psalm 23, that when we find ourselves down in that valley of the shadow of death, that God promised that because we are faithful to him, he will take us out of that valley. You see, we read the book of Daniel. I don't know if I mentioned it yesterday. God did not prevent those three young men from the fiery furnace. But we read that he was with them in the fiery furnace. And that's why Nebuchadnezzar said, I threw three in the fiery furnace, but I see four of them, and the fourth is like the son of God. God did not prevent Daniel to find himself in the lion's den. But Daniel experienced God's presence and he said, God sent his angels and he closed the mouth of the lions so they did not harm you. But God did not take Daniel out of the lions then. Brothers and sisters, God never promised to us that in our daily walk and daily life always will be sunshine. That we will always, always experience the best of this life. No. I met 
faithful Seventh-day Adventists who were so faithful to God, giving the money, supporting the mission, paying tithe. And they admitted me. They said, more I'm faithful to God, more and more I am broke. For me, one of the difficulty was when I was in one big city and after preaching the sermon, an elderly person invited me say, I would be honored if you can come with me and be guest for a lunch. I went to him. When we were sat at the table to have lunch, then I realized actually he was a retired pastor. Just before we started eating, he asked me, Pastor Stefanovich, can I just ask you if you can join me for a few moments? I did not know what he planned to do with me. So he took me to a room and it was the whole lab there. I said, what is this? He told me, brother Anko, I served God the whole my life. God was always good to me. And I was faithful to everything what God was asking for me, including health reform. I was always eating healthy food. I was always careful that I do according to what God was teaching me and he gave to this church. And I never imagined. When I talked to my wife and I said, I have to buy extra health insurance. We said, no, we were faithful to God. Why do we do that? But let's do it anyway. And he said, I never imagined that in my old age, this is the place that I spend every night because my kidneys have given up. Yeah, my, I, I can now keep on telling you stories what I see among people. I saw many faithful people who are suffering and going through the difficulties of life. So what is the difference between Christians now and those who are not Christians, those who are on God's side and those who are not, not on God's side, especially during this pandemic situation with the coronavirus. What is the difference? The difference is that Jesus said that those who are going through the hardships of life and sometimes see that dark side of this life, they are very much blessed because they have received something from God that gives them hope, gives them strength, gives them the assurance and that courage and strength that they can go and move through this difficulty of life. Or as David said in Psalm 23, even though I go through the valley of shadow, shadow of death, you will be with me and you will be walking with me to sustain me and you will never, never forsake me. My brothers and sisters, this is the lesson that God wants to teach us during this time. That we cannot trust ourselves. That this life is very much uncertain. This life is not what we are supposed to live for. That our hope is found only in Jesus Christ. And it's a great gift, gift Macarius, that blessing, that joy that can be experienced only by those who have surrendered their lives to God and have a God as the first and the last in their lives. That's the difference between those who are on God's side and those who are not on, the God, on God's side. This is the meaning of these debatitudes. And this is Jesus' intention. What those who read those beatitudes, that they have to understand and to take the meaning for themselves. But then Jesus 
moves on. And after the Beatitudes, that three verses, sorry, four verses, I'm talking about the verses 13 to 16, in which Jesus uses two metaphors. And he wants to say something to his followers. I believe that all of us, or at least most of us, are familiar with these metaphors. Let us first read verse 13. What is that Jesus tried to say? You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by man. Please, I'd like to invite you that we just have a closer look into this verse 13. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Who are these you that Jesus had in mind? I know if, if we are now in the church setting, uh, each one of us would probably have the idea, who is that you? We, disciples, people who are listening to Jesus. But there is something that is very, very obvious. Because these verses, they built on the Beatitudes that has previously spoken. And when Jesus said you, he meant you who are Makarios, you who are blessed, you who are happy, despite the difficulties, despite the hardships of life through which you are going. You who have that inner motive, that joy, that is not defined by chances and changes of life, that are not defined by the circumstances of life, something the circumstances do not give us and the circumstances cannot take from us. You are the salt of the earth. What is the role and purpose of salt? We all know. The primary purpose of salt is to give the taste to food. And as you know, this is the fact, that the food never impacts salt. Salt always impacts and gives a taste to food. Am I correct? And now Jesus said to his disciples, but you are the salt to the earth. What is that that Jesus tried to say to all of us? You see the circumstances, doesn't matter how hard they are. Sometimes sunshine, sometimes storm, sometimes good times, sometimes bad times. But Jesus says, it's not the circumstances. The environment in which we live, the climate in which we find ourselves, they do not define us as Christians and our relationship with God. It is we who belong to God with that great gift, that gift Macarius, that gift that God gives to those who are on his, his side. We actually impact the circumstances of life. That circumstances of life, doesn't matter how hard they are, they cannot take that joy, that happiness, that God gives to his kids, that happiness that they feel during good times, during sunshine, and that happiness will be as strong in them, as high in them, when sunshine is not any longer, and when stormy circumstances try to harm 
our lives. One student was in my office and we were just talking. He talked about his plans. And he said, Professor, I would like to be like you. And I always try to tell my students never to be, to wish to be like me. We all, they all have to wish to be like Jesus Christ, but we are just human beings with our weaknesses. Okay? We are just sinful human beings. But then he asked me a question and he said, okay, professor, I want to ask you a question. We know that you are a successful scholar and professor here at Andrews, but I'm just curious, how much it would make impact upon you that tomorrow Andrews University tells you, you cannot work here for university and you are rejected, but your friends. And your circumstances of life suddenly completely change. How would it impact your life? I smiled at that young man. I knew why he was asking. Evidently, he was going through very strange times. I told him, I would go and find a job in McDonald's or some other places. Work with a minimum wage. And I would still be the same Christian, because my relationship with God, my Christianity is not defined by my job, by my health, by my relationship with other human beings. It's defined by, only what, by, by uh, um, it, what I have received from God, by being forgiven in that good relationship with you, being accepted by God, and I'm the member, a member of that family of God. And that joy, that belonging to God, that presence of God in my personal life, nobody, the present or the future, good times or bad times, nobody, nothing, no satanic power or demonic power, no human beings actually can take from me. This is what Jesus tried to tell us here. You are the salt to the earth. But then Jesus moves further on and he uses the second metaphor. And he says in verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstands, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You are the light of the world, like salt. So also light impacts the surrounding, impacts the darkness, disperse a darkness. Okay, so impacts significantly darkness. And many commentators, they say we don't understand why Jesus used two metaphors to communicate actually the same fact and the same truth. Actually, there is something that not too many people observe here with this second metaphor, what Jesus tried to say, you are the light to the world. So my question to you is, unfortunately, we cannot communicate, but you can communicate among the members of your family if you are together participating in this Bible study. Okay, we already stated that light impacts dark. You see, I came here to this room. It's evening here in Michigan, okay. I came here to this room, it was dark. So I turned the light and suddenly dark is dispersed. And that's why we can see each other. But the question is, does darkness impact light? 
When I'm speaking in church setting, usually I hear the universal answer, no. Actually, I want to say to you, yes. Darkness also impacts light. Now you wonder how. Let me just tell you about something that I remember when I was a young pastor. And some of you for joining, joining us during the Sabbath morning to this Bible study who are not young any longer. And keep in mind, when I was in my 20s, I saw many old people. Today, I don't see any old person. I see only those who are young and those who are not young any longer. Okay, and some of us, we belong to that second category. But you can remember those old times, 40, 50 years ago. Today, when I park my car, I simply press the button on the door of my car, and I know that everything was okay. But when I was a young person, some of you still remember, you wanted to leave your car, and the first thing you want to be sure that you have a turn off the light on your car. And if you can remember, that was no unusual situation that you can see many people, many drivers, they will sit in the car, try to turn on your engine, and suddenly you realize your battery is empty because when you left your car, before you left, you forgot to turn off the light on your car. You know what I'm talking about. And I remember I would go as a young pastor to church to preach, and I will park my car in front of the church building. It was summer, very much sunshine outside. I would quickly close my door, uh, the door of my car and rush into the building. But there is one of my uh, the members of my church, they would tell me, Pastor, I said, yes, what is? And he said, the lights are on on your car. I look there, I come in front of my car, I even look all around and I say, no, they are not. The pa uh, Pastor, the lights are on. And I look one more time and finally I say, you are right. The lights are on. And I have to unlock my car to turn off the lights. And I would go and to do in the church what I was supposed to do. But then maybe in the evening, I will come to the same church. It was already dark outside. When I leave my car, did I need anybody to tell me that the lights are on? You see, in the morning, I could hardly see it. I, I, I did everything in order in order to see if the lights are on, but now it's dark outside. And I just want to assure you, even if there is distance, there was distance between me and my car, a long distance, if there is no objects between, I could see that the lights are on. Why? Because outside was dark. Now, please, I want to ask you, one more time, the same question. The light impacts darkness, but does darkness impact light? I hope now that you will agree with me. The more dense darkness is, more visible light is. And this is what Jesus tried to say to his disciples. But you're using the second metaphor, not simply to repeat the meaning that was found in the first metaphor of salt. Jesus wanted to go one step higher and to say that those who are on God's side, Christians, not only that they impact the environment, they impact that they impact the circumstances of life. But when they find themselves in the valley of shadow of death, when everything turns against them, 
and they find themselves in a serious crisis. The Christian character, the faithfulness to God, that joy, that gift Macarius that God gave to them shines much more and it's much more visible by the people by whom actually they are surrounded. This is the truth that actually Jesus wanted to communicate to his followers. You see, brothers, sisters, when everything is shiny, when everything is okay, and when the person comes to the church and tells brothers and sisters in the community of believers, oh, I'm so much blessed, praise God, do you see how much I am happy? Tell me, who remembers that? But if the person comes and tells you, a few days ago, doctor told me that I just have two more weeks to live. But praise God, I'm so blessed knowing that my God is very close to me. And very soon when I close my eyes, I know that my God will not actually forget me. I remember she was actually a mother in Israel. I like her very much. I was a number of times in her house. She would prepare a lunch. I was a young pastor. And sometimes she would feed me. And sometimes try to tell me about something as a young man, what I was supposed to know as a young pastor. After a few years, one day somebody knocked on the door of my house. And I opened the door. And there was a young man standing there. He introduced himself. And he mentioned his last name. I asked him, are you son of that and that lady? He said, yes, because that was the name of that mother in Israel. I know how many times she mentioned to me that she had two sons. And she said, Brother Stefanovich, I'm afraid that one day I will not see my sons in the kingdom of God. And that young man told me, Pastor, please, can you go and visit my mother? She needs you at this present moment. Please, she's waiting for you. I asked, what, what is the problem? He said, please, if you can just go and visit my mother. At that time, I did not have a car. I had to take my bike and ride on that bike for about more than half hour to go there. And I was so impatient. I left my bike there in the yard and I rushed into the house and she was there in the room sitting there. I approached her and my first question was, how are you doing? She told me, Praise God, I'm doing well. I said, this is not what I'm asking you. Really, how are you doing? Then she looked at me and then she told me. She said, yesterday, I did not feel very well. I went to visit a doctor. He saw that something was not okay, or, or something was not okay with me. So he sent me to the hospital the same day to do some examinations with me. And finally, the doctors, doctors, they had to talk to me because they told me that I have cancer in advanced stage and that, that I have just a limited time to live. But then she looked at me and she said, Brother Anko, my son, don't worry. I am with God, I'm very strong. I know, I know that my God will not forsake me. And I tried to visit her as many times as possible. But every time when I visited her, I saw that she was, her health condition was worsening every time, every time when I met her. 
One day, it was Sabbath afternoon, I decided to pay a visit to her. That's what I did. I came to her house. I entered the house. And there in the room, I saw there on the bed, just a skeleton covered with skin. And in the room, there are several ladies, the neighbors who came to support her and to encourage her during those difficult moments. I was sure that this was the last time that I saw her alive. I'm a very sensitive person and I was young. I did not know how to behave, what to say in that situation as I was sitting speechless. Suddenly one of the ladies sitting there, she addressed me and she said, a pastor. I said, yes, mom, how can I help you? She said, there is one thing I don't understand. Do you see her? And she named our mother in Israel. And she said, do you see, she served her God for 40 years. She went through many family, bad relationships and suffering and harassment because of her faith. And now do you see what she is experiencing from her God? Can you explain it to me? Other ladies, suddenly they jump, try to calm her down, telling her to stop talking. And really, I did not know how to react. I did not know what to say. At that moment, I noticed how that skeleton on the bed, trying to lift herself from the bed, and I jumped and tried to help her and to put her in the half-sitting position. And then with a trembling voice, she started speaking, looking into that lady who just made that comment and telling her, yes, I served my God for 40 years. And he was always good to me. He has never abandoned me. He was always with me and beside me in the most difficult periods of my life. I don't know and I don't have the answer about the situation in which I am now. I know that my life is coming to its end. But when I close my eyes, I will do it with that hope that my God, who walked with me during these 40 years of this earthly life, will one day stand on my grave and call me by my name into that new life. And then she looked into that lady and with that trembling voice to tell her, but one day you will also have to close your eyes. Will you close your eyes in that faith that your God one day will stand on your grave and call you by your name? I don't want to tell you about what happened next because the next winter time in that place I had evangelistic series. And I don't want to tell you about the result that happened at that evangelistic series as a result of that powerful lady who had that gift of Macarius, that joy, that awareness of the closeness of God in her life, that no circumstances of life can take that joy from her. Yes, more dense darkness is, and more terrible dark appears around us, more visible light is. And Jesus said, you are 
the salt of this earth and you are the light to the world. My brothers and sisters, please just allow me in the conclusion of this Bible study that we have. I would like to ask you one question. Do you really feel blessed by God? That's this greatest of all gifts that the person can receive from God actually sustains you, gives you strength, gives you courage, provides you with the hope during this perilous time that we call pandemic coronavirus situation which the whole humanity on earth has found its, its, its self. It's my sincere desire that this sermon that Jesus preached really give us and provide us with that great comfort, with that hope, with that greatest gift that Jesus wants to give to all of us. And when we find ourselves in the difficulties of life, when money does not matter any longer, when many things that we paid so great value on them actually becomes worthless, at that moment we understand that there is something that money cannot buy and the chances and changes of life and the circumstances of life they cannot take from us according to the promise that Jesus made in this sermon on the mount. My brothers and sisters, these times through which the whole human beings are going through as we are Christians also are part of this hardship in which the world finds itself. My question is, what is that that we can offer to the people around us? People live in fear. Do we behave as the world? Can we offer something to the world that they don't have, that light, that more dense darkness is. As Jesus says, that that light will shine, that people can see our good deeds and to glorify our God who is in heaven. My brothers and sisters, I don't know how we are spending this time in which we find ourselves as we are confined in current in, in, in our homes, we cannot move, we don't have freedom. I don't know how much is in Israel, yeah, but I just want to tell you, for three weeks I didn't go anywhere, I'm in my house. How am I spending this time? I find some Adventists, everything what they're doing, including the Sabbath day, they're going to internet, they're feeding themselves with diff different conspiracy theories. They're going to internet, they're feeding themselves with some sensational interpretation of prophecy. They know already that Sunday law uh, is, is established. They know everything that after this coronavirus, these things will happen, these things happen, these things happen, and all they are doing, not to try to reach the members of their own family, the people in the world with that good message, the message of hope, that our God is still in charge of history. All they are doing, trying to find the followers in the church for their fancy ideas that are just product of imagination and ignorance. How do we spend our time? This time is for our soul searching. What is the testimony that actually we give to the people around us? Allow me now in the conclusion just that we read something with which Jesus, with these words, with these verses, 
actually Jesus concluded his whole Sermon on the Mount. You know that Jesus used here other metaphors with the intention to tell something to those who belong to him. And I'm reading from verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Jesus uses here a metaphor of building house on the rock. And we know that in the Bible, a rock is a well-known metaphor for God and also for Jesus Christ in the, New, in the New Testament. All what God wants us to do is to build the house of our salvation, to build, to build our future on him, because he is in charge of the future, and he holds the future in his hands. If we build our relationship with him, if we build our hope on him, if within us there is that joy, that joy macarius, that's not defined by the circumstances, by chances, and by changes of life, when somewhere in the future, as the prophecy is telling us, as the world will face, those serious challenges that will be much more serious than this coronavirus. When winds begin to blow, when the storm comes, and the flooding waters hit on the house of our salvation that we build on that rock, we will still be firm with our God because he is presence will follow us and he will never forsake those who are on his side. But then Jesus goes and he says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell. And great was its fall, as Jesus concludes. My brothers and sisters, we have a choice to build our future, our present and our future, on that rock of God himself, on that rock of Jesus Christ. And we do not need to be afraid about the future and what will happen in the days that to follow. But if we build our future, our eternal destiny on sand, which is on a human opinions, on conspiracy theories, on human manipulation with biblical prophecies that cannot be supported with the Bible, on human ideas and what human beings they think and they say. The Bible is telling us that the future will show how firm we are in what we believe. The time is coming according to Jesus when the rain will come, the flooding waters will hit our house and the winds will blow trying to destroy that house. And Jesus says, since that house is not built on the rock, but the sand, will actually experience a terrible times that will end in a crash. In the concluding of this study that we have, I want to invite you, if you have a building your house, or the circumstances of life, on what people say, what people think, how people relate to you. 
or different conspiracy theories, different manipulations of biblical, biblical prophecies on human ideas and what people think the way, what people want to explain, to say their views about, about, about the future. God is calling us at this moment, inviting us to examine our lives and make the decision, Lord, I want from this day on to build the house of my future only on you. Can you make that decision? If you do, then Jesus Christ promised to give you that precious gift that is expressed with that Greek word makarios, that Jesus gave that completely different meaning. Makarios that describes that blessedness, that joy, that happiness, that do not depend on the chances and changes of life and that the circumstances cannot take that joy and that happiness from us. That's the gift that Jesus Christ secured on the cross of Calvary. And that gift he's offering to each one of us. Are you willing to accept that gift? Doesn't matter how long you have been as a Christian, as a Seventh-day Adventist. But if you understand at this moment that the house of your salvation was built on that, song, on, on that sand, now it's the time for change. Please invite God into your life and build your house of salvation on that rock, which is God himself. Accept that gift, Macarius, Macarius, that gift, which is actually Jesus himself. And please allow me at this moment, at the conclusion of this study, I'd like to invite you, wherever you are, in the corner of your house, as you are watching, okay, our study that we have done in this moment, I'm asking you, if you are members of the family, Hold your hands at this moment. If you need, don't need to keep that physical distance, do it. If you can bow your heads. And I like that this moment that we dedicate ourselves to God and to allow God that even though we go, even through the valley of shadow of death, that that promise of God, that promise of God be realized in our personal life that we feel his presence and his closeness with our daily walk with him. Our heavenly father, I want to give thanks to you for this one hour and a little bit more that we spent together in order to contemplate on the teaching of our savior Jesus Christ that he delivered 2000 years ago those multitude of people on the shore on the Sea of Galilee. Father, thank you for that gift. Thank you for reminding us that those who belong to you, you're giving them something that, do not de that does not depend on the changes and chances of life, giving them that, that happiness and blessings that no circumstances of this life can take it from them. Oh Lord, you invited us to be the salt and the light to the world. We know that we cannot do it by ourselves, but please take us and help us that during this very special time, that there are some people, maybe the members of our family, our close friends, maybe even some of the members of the community of believers to whom we belong. We can be used by you to direct their eyes toward you as our only hope, as the one who holds the future. Help us that we can build our future on that rock, rock 
that has a root in you on the rock of salvation, that Father, you are that rock. Oh, Father, please, please help us that we do not build our salvation and our hope in the future on the sand. Thank you, Father, we are waiting for the day when our Savior Jesus Christ will come, when all hardships of life, all tears, all pain, all death, coronavirus, the economic, terrible economic situation that can follow, all of this will come to its end. We'll find ourselves in the new Jerusalem when our Savior will call us by our name. Thank you for a promise. And thank you that that promise will one day come true. Thank you, Father, for we pray all of this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>